So in words, what this is, is the amount of potential energy required to open a new crack of unit, uh, of unit surface. Okay. And so if you go to the lab and you test 100 samples mm -hmm. and you realize that all of them, you know, it's 100 samples that are all prepared the same way, and you realize that all of them, you know, at least statistically defined, in a statistically defined way, all of them break. When I say break, I mean, you know, the sample breaks into two, it ruptures. All of them break at some stress. So the applied stress is equal to some critical value, okay? Then we'd say that this is GC, and that's equal to pi A critical. Let's see, there should be a okay, well, sorry, no pi A. Critical. And this is called uh, the Griffiths failure criterion. So this is you know, this is the critical value of the strain energy release hurdle. Right? So this is this is a material property. Right? This is what if you went to the lab and you did a setup like this, you could measure that every time, right? You know the crack length. These are material properties you'd know, and so it turns out that you know this is a material property. It's it's called the critical strain energy release hurdle, or uh, sometimes this is referred to as the Griffith criteria. So if I just rearrange that equation, so all I did was rearrange the terms in that equation. I get something that looks like this. And this thing is often referred to as the stress intensity factor, K. I'll put a little one there, and we'll talk about where the one comes from in a second. But uh, so this is the stress intensity factor. So that it's related to G. And this idea was introduced by Irwin in 1957. And this forms the basis of something called LEFM, linear elastic fracture mechanics. Okay. So he introduced it as a way to account for the singularity and stress that occurs at the tip of a crack. And then, you know, it turned out it's, it is related to the Griffith criteria. So they're, they're both material properties. You can measure, you know, they're, but they're related to one another. They effectively measure the same thing, right? The crack's resistance to propagation. Okay. Uh, it's far more common to see the stress intensity factor, you know, reported. Um, don't really have a good reason why. I guess uh, there's sort of more straightforward ways to do fracture toughness testing uh, for a variety of samples. So the, uh, you know, when Irwin's approach, and again, it's a way to account for the singularity and stress field, but he basically said that, you know, the, the full stress tensor then in front of the crack tip, where r is some distance from the crack tip, is a function like this. And um, I guess if you have a crack tip and you place a coordinate system on the crack tip, 
such that you have some radius r and some angle theta. Then you can define the stress anywhere in front of the crack tip uh, via some function like this. And f is some function, it's, it's some function of the applied loading and the geometry of the sample. Okay. So, you know, you could ha there's lots of ways. You, you could go to the lab, for example, and you could prepare center cracked s plates like, like we've been discussing, which is kind of difficult to do. Or you could go in and have single edge not notch or compact tension specimen. Um, you can have many, many types of specimens that you can go and test, but the sort of geometry specific part would be contained in this guy, and, and you'd always get the same, you know, if you did the test properly, you'd always, no matter what your sample geometry and configuration is, you'd, you'd always get the same stress intensity factor. And again, just to be clear, remember at least like our one dimensional definition of stress, right? Stress in 1D is like Young's modulus times strain. And strain mathematically is the partial derivative of u, the displacement with respect to x, right? Well, at the tip of the crack, there's a discontinuity in displacement. And so this derivative is undefined. And so this technically is undefined at the tip of the crack. And so this is this theory was introduced to account for that. It's sort of a there's sort of a hole in the Cauchy momentum theory, right? And so this this whole LEFM was was an add-on. It's a, it's a way to address the hole. And so you know you, you the, just also the, the Square, the square root of r thing, what, what you see is uh, if you have a distance r and you looked at, say, one of the components of stress, like the hoop stress, the theta theta component, as you move the distance away from the crack tip, so the crack tip would be here at zero, then you'd get some, because of the square root dependence, you, you'd get some, some decay like that. So it's, it's essentially infinite at the crack tip, and it decays via the square root as you move away. So I, uh, I introduced this one here, but I didn't say why. And I guess technically it, it wasn't necessary to, to put it there. But typically when we talk about stress intensity factors, we talk about three modes of loading, one, two, and three. So, if you have a sample with a crack in it, mode one would be the opening mode. So if I applied a load to the crack faces like that, that's mode one. Right? And so this is the this is the typical mode in a hydraulic fracture, right? Because we're we're applying a pressure to the interior faces of the crack, opening it. Right? So this is mode one. It turns out uh, mode one is probably uh, if you have fracture toughness data at all, there's probably 90% chance it's mode one. Uh, it's it's the most common one to test. For it's the easiest one to test. First of all, uh, the second reason is most fractures grow in mode one. It turns out, and a lot of times, even if they're initiated in sort of a mode two, uh, you, you'll get a transition to where mode one dominates the fracture propagation, typically. So mode two is sort of a shear mode. So if I apply a shear on the crack face, right? and this one we can actually induce in hydraulic fracture operations also. I mean, you know, when we 
you know, this is essentially what, if you get any crack extension uh, of a natural fracture caused by stress redistributions from a nearby hydraulic fracture, intersecting hydraulic fracture, and these things emit little microseismums. We talked about microseismics a little bit last time. Little tiny earthquakes we can hear with geophones, right? Those are, you know, likely mode two, right? You're causing the fracture to slip a little bit and possibly a little bit of crack extension. And just for completeness, I mean, it's not really relevant to hydraulic fracturing in any way. Uh, but you, you, do, you can have mode three fractures as well. And so this would be this type of action, the tearing mode. And so then your, your total energy release rate can be related to the three fracture modes. this. And so when I said earlier, you know, mode one typically dominates in fracture, uh, the, the total energy, right, remember what this is, it's the total amount of potential energy associated with an unit extension or crack wound. Typically in any given fracture, this term is much bigger than these. Yeah. So, for the most part, these guys are interchangeable. I mean, if, if I if I had a failure criterion that was based on G, and but I gave you measurements in terms of fracture toughness. Oh, I guess I, I never even mentioned what fracture toughness is. If I, so so, <coughs> so just like we had a GC, a critical value at which a crack will propagate, we also have a KC. Right? So if I just put Cs in front of all these, this would be the critical value. So. The critical value of the stress intensity factor. Okay, that's at the moment that a crack will initiate. The value of the stress intensity factor at the moment the crack initiates. Okay. And it turns out that we, there's a name, a special name for that, right? So the, the name is called the fracture toughness. Okay. So for the most part, these are interchangeable. If I gave you the fracture toughness from experiments, but you had some failure criteria in a computer code that was a function of the energy release rate, which would be the case if you were using cohesive zones, for example. You probably don't know what that is, but it's okay. Um, however, I want to say that the stress intensity factor is relegated to the realm of linear elastic fracture mechanics. It has no validity outside of linear elastic fracture mechanics. And this is a linear elastic fracture mechanics is some people are, well, what, how do you define that? Okay. And so Erwin introduced this idea of what he called small scale yielding. And so if you have a crack in a body, right, there's, there's really no such thing as infinite stress. Right? I mean, in, a, in a real body, there's never going to be an infinite value of stress. So very localized to the crack, if you zoom in a bunch of link scales, Right? There's going to be localized activity that's occurring all the way down to atomistics. Right? I mean, atomistically, a crack is propagating because it's breaking atomic bonds. Right? But there's many link scales in between the atoms and the continuum where, we're, where the theory is introduced. Right? And like, for example, in a metal, you can have lots of localized plasticity and other things occurring, slip, 
And the idea of small scale yielding is that there's some small plastic zone around the cracktail. Plastic means right, not elastic, inelastic, some inelastic region right at the crack tip. And uh, the, the, the idea is that this localized inelasticity is very, very small compared to the crack length and the overall sample size. So what is small? Well, that's, that's up for debate, I guess. But I didn't put this in my notes, so I'm working from memory here. I know when you go and you do, I think the, I think the ASTM, there's an ASTM standard for, fra for plain strain fracture toughness testing. I want to say it's like E399 or something like that. I'm really working from memory. I, I don't know. Okay. So this would be the standard manual you would use if you want to go to the lab and you do these tests. And in there, then there's an equation that says your final value of fracture toughness has to satisfy this equation. Uh, it's got to be the other way. The units won't be right. Again, I, I didn't have this in my notes. I'm working from memory. Uh, so the, the value of fracture toughness that you measure squared over the yield strength squared. Must be larger than 2.5A. That's the definition of small, I think. I'll, I'll double check that, but it's in the standard. It's something like that. It's got the right units. <laughs> so that, that would be, you know, this is what we've experimentally determined is the definition of small, right? So if, you're, uh, if your, your value there, uh, yeah, so if your measured value of that over the yield strength is satisfies this condition, then you've satisfied small scale yielding and linear elastic fracture mechanics is valid. Okay? Now, it sort of went off a tangent there, but the point I was going to say is these guys are relegated to linear elastic fracture mechanics and linear elastic fracture mechanics only. But G is more general. Right? So G can be used where you have some plasticity. And this is pretty common, uh, maybe not necessarily for rocks, but if you have some plasticity before failure, then G, you know, really it's still just the area under this curve, right? I guess if, if you had a failure, it wouldn't unload elastically. It would be like that. So. And the more common way to get something that's analogous to G is to use something called the J integral. And we're not going to talk about that, but the J integral was, it's just a sort of a clever way to come up with, uh, even in a, a setting where you have plasticity at the crack tip, uh, it's a clever way to come up with a value that's analogous to G. So it, again, it represents the same thing. It's the total potential energy required to extend a crack of unit area. Okay. So then <coughs> in a simple in a simple uh, hydraulic fracture application then we have that K1 is equal to the pressure in the fracture minus the minimum principal stress. So this is going to be the either SH min or the vertical stress, and that's going to determine whether the crack will grow horizontally or vertically. Over pi L, where L is a fracture half length. Right? So during then during propagation, 
Uh, by the way, sometimes we call this the net pressure. Right? So it's a difference in the pressure in the fracture and the far field principal stress that's acting against it, trying to close the fracture. Right? So P net, uh, so then during propagation, P net is equal to K1C over pi L. And so this would be, you know, there's some assumptions there that this is uh, plain, uh, a plain strain, you know, semi-infinite body, half fracture length L. So I, I think that's probably a good place to stop. Next time we'll start talking about analytic fracture models.